So welcome everyone to today's talk, Insects and Other Arthropods in Our Culture, Field Survey, Biotechnology and Genomics. This is the fifth talk of a series targeting to promote agrobiotechnology and enhance understanding of the potential applications of agricultural products. We hope the series will inspire international scholars, researchers, farmers, and business in the agricultural field, as well as the interested public. First, let me introduce our speaker today. Professor Jerome Holem Hoi is an associate professor in the School of Life Sciences at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and is the director of the biology program. He obtained a bachelor degree in biology and a master degree in zoology at the University of Hong Kong. After pursuing his PhD in zoology at the University of Oxford, he spent a few years in the United Kingdom conducting postdoctoral research. His research interests include insect and arthropod biology, zoonotic diseases, insect plant interactions, marine biotechnology, molecular ecology, conservation of biodiversity, and evolutionary biology. In the following presentation, he is going to bring up several studies carried out by his laboratories, including a field survey of insects in local farms and genetic studies in insects in order to make new biotechnological applications and genomic studies in establishing new models in agriculture to shed light on these neglected areas. Now, please welcome Professor Hoi to the floor. Professor Hoi, please. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, Professor Lam. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, can you hear me well? Okay, right. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Lam, for the very kind introduction and also invitation. I uh, also thank Joanna for the organization. So, uh, well, I, I, I wasn't expecting that I talk in the room and that it finally it is later to be assumed. I mean, throughout. I mean, I understand that people also coming from the other part of the world, I mean, coming from uh, South Africa. I mean, uh, so thank you. I mean, uh, I hope it's not going to disappoint you. So uh, what I'm going to do today, I mean, I, I'm going to talk about uh, insects and other arthropods in agriculture. So uh, typically what I'm trying to do, I mean, I, I understand that many of us, I mean, uh, who are interested, I mean, uh, will be trying to improve the crop yields. I mean, whilst this is certainly very important, I mean, uh, we, we in, especially in my group, that we think that um, understanding the insects and other arthropods in agriculture can actually have in that way. So typically I'm trying to, do, to go through several studies that have been ongoing or published, I mean, by my lab. So I come from the School of Life Sciences and also a state key laboratory of agrobiotechnology. And of course, I also need to thank the area of excellence, I mean, uh, for, for, uh, for funding the research and also organizing this talk. So in, in the next uh, 30, 40 or 50 minutes, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to go through four big directions. I mean, I'm trying to group them together. Of course, it will be all relating to plants and insects and other course. So the first part, I'm going to give a very brief introduction about global food security especially relating to one of the major themes of our university, which is on environment and sustainability. And then I'm going to talk about an ongoing field survey that has been carried out by people in my lab. I mean, I will mention them later. And then from field survey, when we understand what they are there, what kind of biotechnology can we do and how can we learn something from genomics? Of course, I mean, <clears throat> Many of you know, I mean, there's a 
food security is a global issue. I mean, uh, it, you are well, taking, I mean, I just take a picture coming from the internet. You, you obviously see that different places are heavily reliant on different kinds of crops. I mean, uh, uh, this may be oversimplified. The point is clear. Nobody wants hunger. I mean, we want to have food security. And especially that if you look into the world population, world population has been increasing and seems to be predicted to be keep on increasing. So from 5.3 billion to now, I mean, what we were expecting will be more than 11.2 billion. I mean, by the time of 2100. And when you, when, oh, sorry. When you look into the global yield of uh, uh, U production, you see that it's actually need to be an increase, ever increasing trend for the for the yield in order to meet this kind of increasing food demand. This is a study not carried by us, I mean by the other group, but what is showing you here? I will, I will bring you through that. So this is trying to predict the national scale yield of loss for maize, rice, eat, and soybean throughout the whole world. So uh, there are different reasons for them to cause for the, for the laws that could be including the environmental factors changing, like the heat stress or flood events, etc. But one thing that I would like to point to you is the coming slide, which is global loss of crop production is also due to the impact of climate warming. At the same time, when climate change, insects numbers will also change. And typically, when for those that are inside pests, they will be in temp seems to be increasing. Again, this is not a study done by us, but when you look into, if you follow my mouse cursor, wheat, rice, maize, and soybean, etc. So throughout the whole world, climate change, I mean, you actually increase the metabolic rate for the insects. So basically, what 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 the point I mean to to bring over here is that, well, when the temperature is going to to increase. The, um, you, you increase the metabolic rate of the insects. And when you increase the metabolic rate of the insects at the same time, I mean, you have more and more insects. I mean, if the generation time is going to get shorter, et cetera. And then eventually, if you have more insects, you lose your crop yield. What I'm trying to show you in this slide, I mean, uh, is, is that insects and plants, I mean, in typically when we are talking about crops, are actually very, very related. I mean, you, well, we don't think insects as uh, just a term. I mean, unless you will be differentiating them into two, two big groups, if you want. I mean, so unless you will be thinking about something like pest, I mean, to which they will be targeting your crops. But at the same time, some insects are good. For example, they will, I mean, like bees, I mean, or some insects that will be taking away your pests. So we also have beneficial insects. Other than the two types of insects, the other thing that we need to consider is that Plant and insects actually have evolved a kind of interaction. For example, I mean, uh, I, I don't have time to go through. I mean, so I pick up one very good review. You, if you're interested, you can go and read it. So basically, plants would produce terpenes to attract, I mean, uh, bees, I mean, uh, uh, and et cetera, other beneficial insects. At the same time, I mean, insects will also pose some um, different interactions onto the plants. So plants will also go back into defense, et cetera. So it's a very, very interesting interactions. But when we look into modern day of trying to estimate a crop yield, we usually, many people will think, oh, insects may not be so important because traditionally, many of us have been thinking if we can keep on increasing the crop yield, that should be fine. But now people think that because of climate change, the insect interaction, especially the influence for insects on the crops, actually increased tremendously. So even though if you can double your yield, well, the insects rate, if they grow even quicker, you can completely demolish or damage your crop production. So I hope I will be able to bring you the importance for accounting the fact and factor of insects into agriculture. So now I'm beginning to talk about studies carried out by my lab. So one thing that the first thing we come into is to thinking, well, what are actually the beneficial or the pest insects that we have here in Hong Kong? So uh, very fortunately that we have been funded by the Sustainable Agriculture 
and Development Fund. Uh, together, we have been working together with the Environmental Association and also the WWF of Hong Kong. Uh, together, of course, I mean, we have uh, some very talented uh, personnel in the lab, which I will mention later in the next slide. So we have been doing a two-year weekly field survey in farmlands. So uh, this very, these young people, I mean, what they're trying to do is they go to the field, they set out traps, like what I've been showing you here, trying to look into doing the flying traps for flying insects, and also doing the traps for the soil insects. They also do hand picking, and then and also try to raise some of them in the lab. And the way they're trying to do that, because now we don't really have a big clue, or we don't have understanding what is actually happening in the farmland in Hong Kong right now. And through this study, which is still an ongoing study, we're in the second year now, and we'll finish it by the end of the year, I want to share with you some exciting results we have got. So uh, typically, I mean, if you look into the bottom of the right-hand side, this has been done by Kay, Jennifer, and Mel, I mean, in the lab. So after the handpicking, they try to go back into the lab and try to raise them. For example, a locus, I mean, they're showing you here, well, we will be able to document different developmental stages. I mean, rather than people will say, oh, this insects, a juvenile stage, I mean, or larvae stage, it's very difficult for us to identify. So we have been trying to do that, I mean, for all the insects that we'll be able to, to get and obtain in the farmland. So uh, a very quick summary, I mean, uh, which uh, seems to be unfair to their very hard work, but uh, we, we have lots to share today. So uh, basically today we have already identified around 78 species of agricultural crops, vegetables, or other products, I mean, uh, uh, in Hong Kong, and we, we surveyed them, and around, we, we have been able to find 162 insect species. Among them, 121 species actually pests, okay? 11 species are potentially pests because uh, this is still ongoing. We need more time to identify what they are. And uh, 20 of, around 20 species are beneficial insects, and 10 of them are neutral. So uh, I know you're very interested in those. Uh, don't worry, at the end of the talk, I will show you a website. You can go and see our ongoing work. But the end of this project, funded by the uh, SADF, together with WWF and Environmental Association, we are actually trying to make an app, okay? So there will be a mobile app that is freely available. Uh, you can download on, uh, on, your, on your mobile phone. So it will be something like, we are, we, it's only a prototype right now. I hope you'll be able to see, and I'm going to show you a video. So it's not going to be like, exactly like this, but this is a 3D model for, for a fruit fly that we, we get from, from the field. So uh, of course, when it's properly done, Sorry, can I put the next slide? Uh, it will be a 3D model on your mobile phone. You can actually rotate it, okay? So we will be doing that for around 50 common pest species in Hong Kong. So you, oh, and then you can say, oh, when you're growing a vegetable, or maybe a cabbage in Hong Kong, then you say, oh, okay, I see, oh, there's a worm. We always call them worm, that what that is. Then on your app, then you can actually do a 3D model, and then you can, you can try to find them. And you say, oh, okay. As the caterpillar for the cabbage white butterfly, okay, for example. So uh, this is ongoing, and of course, uh, it, will be a, it will be a very, very informative uh, apps, and, uh, and also we have a website for that. Uh, we will show you the link, and if you're interested, go for that. By the end of this year, this app will be available, and we will also document all the paths that we're able to find in Hong Kong. So, now I want to move the gear a little bit. Of course, I mean, uh, uh, we now have a better understanding about the past in Hong Kong. But what can we do, okay, uh, uh, as academics in universities? So we, we try to do something slightly, I mean, we always try to do slightly different things on two aspects. For example, we want to control the insect numbers. On, good, on the good side, we want to combine, so we want to attack the insect pests. We want to eliminate that. But, but I will show you what are the problems that we have right now. I mean, so you say, well, why can't we just use insecticides to do that? There's an issue for that, I will tell you later. But at the same time, we also want to conserve. We also want to control the insect numbers by 
For example, some of the beneficial insects can we boom their numbers. So we want to increase the number of beneficial insects and we want to decrease the numbers of insect pests. So here, I need to begin to introduce a slightly more um, academics. I hope you, it's okay. I understand people com are coming from very, very diverse backgrounds. So allow me to go through this uh, slowly. So in insects, of course, then, um, if you further divide them biologically, we can mainly divide it into two groups. Of course, there are more groups, but let's introduce two groups today. They are the hemimetabolins and homometabolins. What are they? You know, look into the picture on the right hand side, okay? So this is the grasshopper. For example, this is incomplete metamorphosis. Once they are born from the egg, they hatch out from the egg, they are nymph, and then they just grow in size, okay? This is what, and then they pretty much look like more, more or less the same like the adult when they're born. We call them hemimetabolins, that means they do incomplete metamorphosis. On the other hand, I think the typical example that we will go, go through complete metamorphosis are those like the butterflies. For example, I mean, the, the picture on the lower panel, when, an, when, when they hatch from the egg, they become the larvae. The larvae are feeding on, for example, leaves. They, they eat enough, then they go into different stages. It will become a pupae. For the pupae, then they further develop and then become the adult. Adult, in this case, have wings go to uh, another territory and then uh, mate again and then have eggs. This is what we call complete metamorphosis. In either case, no matter the hemimetabolins or the hem holometabolins, what is actually controlling them for the development is this green line, okay? It's this green line, no matter on the hemimetabolins or the holometabolins, it's this green line, which is actually the hormone, the hormone titer. That is called juvenile hormone. So they are kind of sesquiterpenoid. Don't worry about those. Let's call them juvenile hormone first. They're called juvenile hormones because at the juvenile stage, they have a lot of juvenile hormone. And then suddenly you drop the juvenile hormone. And after that, then, for example, in this case, they will come from nymph and then become adult. And on the hormone metabolism, they will go through different stages of uh, metamorphosis from larvae, pup to adult. The reasons I want to bring you onto the sesquiterpenoid and typically on the juvenile hormone is because it is a very, very important hormone for the regulation, for the growth and development of insects. And actually because of that, people also use this as the drug. And in, in, in this case, it's the insecticides. They're so, they're so powerful. So um, this is a slightly busy slide. So let me go through the left-hand side first on the Rudy bit before I go into the whole diagram bit, okay? So uh, it's very difficult to synthesize chemically juvenile hormones, so you cannot produce a lot of juvenile hormones. That would be so expensive to do. So what people actually do, they try to synthesize some chemicals that are in a structure, chemical structure that is very similar to juvenile hormone. So if you look into, so they are called mefropine, uh, phenosica and also periprofosphin, uh, okay? So in these three cases, if you look into the structure on the right-hand side, so they, this is the insect juvenile hormone, very difficult to chemically synthesize. This is the one that is look like, I mean, having the backbone, I mean, modify a little bit structure. So they can be synthesized cheaply and expensively, and they actually, for example, mefropine, uh, for, for many of the reservoirs, I mean, uh, uh, for example, in the United States, they will put mefropine into the reservoir. In this case, because, well, the mosquito needs to be undergo metamorphosis from, from hatching larvae, and then they will become the uh, adult mosquito, right? So if you put them into water, it will, it will prevent mosquito growth, okay? So it, but, but this is because, they are using a chemically synthesized um, structure. In that case, they're not specific. They're not specific. On the other hand, it also affects other animals. For example, it, you may have uh, crustaceans like crayfish in the reservoir, so they're also affected because the structure is very similar. 
On the other hand, you have uh, phenoxicam. They're, they're even cheaper than mefloprine, also useful, but if you put it in the reservoir, or et cetera, they're also toxic to fish. The other drug is uh, used to be uh, uh, using, actually used on the cotton crops uh, to control the white fly growth, but on the, uh, it's also useful for the fleas, I mean, in household pests. The major problem is that they look like juvenile hormone. If they are specific, they're not specific to only insects, they're they can also be toxic to other groups. Even though there seems to be more specific to insects, you have an issue. The issue is that you will be indiscriminate. Either if you remember, I was saying they are pests, of course you eliminate them. But if they are beneficial insects, for example, bees, they will also affect the bees. So you are, you are affecting all the insects or even on related groups, okay? So this is the problem of using juvenile hormone mimics as in insecticides. Very effective, but not specific. So my lab has been trying to do this, I've uh, been almost in CU for nine years. So we, we have been trying to do almost a decade trying to understand this question. So we want to develop something that can be specifically also controlled to juvenile hormone, but at the same time, that would be specific to that particular animal rather than to all insects, you see what I mean? So here, I understand people are also coming from very, very diverse background. So what I need to do is I need to go through this uh, briefly, very, very briefly, okay? So uh, for example, if you understand the cytochrome that we, we are protein coding DNA, we, we have a DNA transcribed for an RNA, RNA translated for protein. You know that insulin gene, RNA, and then we produce insulin, okay? So juvenile hormone genes produce juvenile hormone, I mean, et cetera. So non-coding RNA are, 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 are kind of RNA to which they will be encoded from DNA to become RNA. They will not be translated into protein. But this kind of RNA are now, for example, microRNA, okay? One type of uh, small RNA, which I'm not going to go into the details, uh, because of the diverse background that we have here, they will be actually will be able to target, for example, if you follow, uh, sorry, follow my mouse cursor, the microRNA will target back into the RNA and affect the protein expression. So in that case, for example, if you have a microRNA being present, they will target the juvenile hormone well, synthetic pathway genes and enzyme, for example, then you theoretically, you will affect the juvenile hormone only in that insect, you see what I mean? That's the whole idea. Uh, long story short, yes, uh, it's possible. So we found the first microRNA that is actually targeting the juvenile hormone biosynthesis in fruit flies a few years ago. So um, if, you, if you see what I, I'm showing you here, I mean, this is the summary. We found a microRNA called Bantam. This Bantam is going to target a, a gene for juvenile, juvenile hormone SMU5 transferase. Don't worry, JHMT, this is an enzyme that is going to, is the last and most crucial step for the synthesis for juvenile hormone. So once you have a microRNA targeting it, we put them into the flip fly, you will either result in FQP, okay? Or for those that will, may be able to escape, but eventually they can't, you will have a genital effect. What is the genital effect? Follow my mouse cursor over here. This is the W11X, which is close to the wild type. This is a male, okay? This is a male penis, okay? So the male genital organ is supposed to be a straight orientation. So when you have the female, you, you insert your penis into your vagina doing fertilization. But in this case, when you actually modulate the activity for, for the juvenile hormone gene, gene first, okay? What you're resulting is the misorientation, your penis, not your, sorry, the fruit fly penis, it's going to get misorientation, okay? And when it's getting misorientation, what it's actually do is they cannot actually cross. And you're right, those flies become sterile, okay? So they're not able to produce the next generation. And of course, if you use the microRNA bantam in this case, you cross the death and also genital um, misorientation. So, and recently, we also begin to look into other microRNAs inside the, the, the flip fly genome and see how they can actually relate to the regulation of the development. So um, 
to, to this is a microRNA cluster. So they have many microRNAs. I'm not going to go into the details. I want to show you one very interesting thing, I mean, uh, which is the, the video over here. So let me try, I just click it, right? So if you, if, yeah, so what do you see? So um, follow my mouse cursor. This is the one with the back abdomen, it's the male, and, and this is a female, okay? So usually the male chasing the female and try to ask for caution behavior. So, um, so of course, it, 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 it keeps chasing. And what is it using? It's actually using the front pairs of uh, appendages, the legs, to grab the abdomen of the female so that they can, you, you see, they're beginning to touch and then you, you see they're going to do a, a copulation. So I'm not going to show too long. But when we have the microRNA in this case, we have the mutant. So the, the, the appendages, the legs of the, of, the, uh, of the flies are getting shortened. And once they get shortened, you see, this, they, they cannot actually hold their legs and grab the abdomen efficiently. You see this uh, poor guy, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I just wanted to show you a lot. Very long movie, they, they try to touch, you see, it's, it's not going to be efficient in this case. So I uh, stop. So what, what, I, what I was showing you is that um, in, in the biotechnology side, what we're trying to do is to, in, we, also want to have, we also want to control the insect numbers. We also try to develop new generation of insecticides. But this kind of insecticides is, uh, so, so the way that we try to do is to look for uh, developing new type or new generation of insecticides to which the insecticides will be targeting specific species rather than discriminate uh, all the insects or even damaging something not even including insects or fish, et cetera. So we have been using a typical model fruit fly because it is a very good genetics model. But, but fruit fly only, only it fruits, right? I mean, so it damages fruit. It, some people think they also damages a wine, for example. But, but talking about biodiversity, there are so many variations of life on Earth. So can we actually use our techniques to also do them on other types of insects or crops or other things that we will be able to do? Well, we're fortunate we are in, a, in an era of genomics to which previously is so difficult that the whole world needs to focus on few models because we do not have enough people, we do not have enough power. We need the whole world to solve one or two questions together. I think that is reasonable. But now is the time that we can expand a little bit. With the advancement of genomics, now we'll be able to get genomes. We'll be able to understand more. We can establish new models. And I'm trying to tell you some of the things that we have been doing in the lab. Of course, I mean, because of the man sitting next to me, okay, Professor Lamb, I mean, so I think, okay, if we want to develop a model, what shall we do, okay? We have someone keep on persuading you, say, oh, soybean is the best, okay? So, uh, well, okay, yeah, it's very good, of course, it's a good model. We spent several years together, uh, uh, of course, I mean, very luckily, I'm a, with the support of his uh, area of excellence center. So we have been trying to develop a, a new model on the sting bug. The, when many people think about soybean, I mean, many people think about aphids. Of course, aphids are important, but as I've said, when under the climate change, what people are seeing right now seems to be an increasing numbers of sting bug. Our collaborators and friends elsewhere, for example, in, in Korea, what they've been thinking is that Traditionally, when you try to target sting bug, it's easy because you spray insecticides. They are usually very, very dumb, okay? They are there, get the insecticides, they die, okay? But you begin to see this kind of sting bug coming in, which is when you spray the insecticides, they fly away, okay? After the insecticides, they come back, okay? So this has been a new issue that, that we, or, or the soybean field has been facing, especially in Asia. So we need clever ways to, to do that. I, of course, I won't speak more. I mean, uh, I want to leave the room, so I will stop it here. Uh, that's what I'm doing by our student, uh, uh, Richard Tada. So I, I want to show you something else, which is um, something we're doing. 
in addition to agriculture crops, can we also think about something else and plants that we'll be able to do under genomics? And I want to typically bring out this um, species, which is incense tree Eclaria sinensis. That is a very, very related to Hong Kong because that is the name of Hong Kong come from, many people believe. Hong Kong, we call Franklin Harbor or in Sense Port. Because Hong Kong used to be in an industry for trading in Sense Tree throughout the world or at least in Asia. So um, it's now, this tree is now under CITES and also under different laws protection in Hong Kong. So it's a fraction to vulnerable species under the IUCN red list. One major reason that uh, incense tree has been, uh, has been getting a lot of attention and people actually do illegal fouling of those has been because incense tree can actually, when they get wounded, they will produce vaccines. And those vaccines are actually what we call in English other wood, but in Chinese they call chang or chenxiang, okay? So those are actually very, very um, expensive uh, wood products. And, and what people would like to have is actually natural fungal infection. That is fine because that is actually a natural process. But, well, I mean, uh, there, of course, I mean, people, they, they, they want to do fast way to which they, they fell the tree, get a wound. So that has been very, very dangerous. Under climate change, what you'll be seeing is that, um, well, the southern part of China has seems to be, of course, they're trying to grow a lot of uh, incense tree. But at the same time, uh, well, the, 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 habit, the habitat seems to be shifting. Hong Kong remains a very, very suitable environment in growing incense tree. So the natural populations in mainland China have been depleting due to uh, habitat destruction, destruction. So the one in Hong Kong has been a very, very important conservation group. But uh, we have been seeing news from illegal harvesting in Hong Kong as well like chopping, felling, pruning, wounding, etc. So uh, this is the work that have been done by Wen Yenong and also Sean Lo in the lab. I mean, so of course, this is also a collaboration together with our, our herbarium at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So uh, what we are trying to do is we want to use genomics you know, to see whether we can actually help. For example, I mean, now we have published the genome coming from Hong Kong. And then and what we're trying to do is to look for, can we actually identify every single tree? For example, when people cut it, and we actually see, oh, this is actually coming from this area. Or when we do compensatory planting, which is we want to plant trees. I mean, they're in a similar geographical area. Can we be planting trees that are with similar haplotypes so that that will be causing less destruction to that particular ecosystem, for example? And of course, we, we have also identified the the pathway that will be able to, to uh, produce therapies relating to the incense. But as I've said earlier, I want we are, we are a group of uh, zoologists, uh, entomologists. So uh, we're working on plants. We, of course, need experts in plants to work together. But actually, there's one interesting thing we, we would also like to mention, the plant therapies. When I mentioned that insects produce sesquiterpenoids, right? juvenile hormone. Plants also use a very similar pathway and produce terpenes to attract the insects. So this is actually a, a talking point, a sharing point in between the two. And we have been actually looking, this is the unpublished data from uh, PhD student Sean Law. So uh, we have been looking into a moth, okay? This moth is a specialist to which they only target the incense tree. And when they're present, you have complete deforestation, okay? You have complete removal, taking all the leaves of your incense tree. So what I've been telling you from biotechnology, we've been doing a new insecticides. I've been using genomics to establish the new model like together with the soybean, and also we're trying to do conservation, understanding the interactions with other insects for the incense tree. And, and as, you may, as you can see in my topic, I say insects and other arthropods, okay? Can we actually develop some new models for agriculture? So come back into the, I, I only want to share juvenile home today, coming back into here. 
Juvenile hormone dis has been described in insects since the 1950s, okay? In crustaceans, in other groups, mainly in water, maybe not be too related to agriculture, back into late 1980s, they discovered they do not have juvenile hormone. They have something called nufalfenazoa, very similar structure. I'm not going to go through that, but I want to tell you what our lab has been doing. In 2014, I think very luckily, um, uh, if you understand the relationships for different arthropods, insects, the closest group is the crustaceans, like crabs, lobsters, etc. And the immediate closest out group is called myriopods. That is, arthropods, that men, I mean, uh, jointed leg animals, they have uh, lots of legs, like centipedes, mgong, okay? So the whole world is, has been doing together. I mean, at that time, we need the whole world to do one centipede genome. I mean, our group has been very, very fortunate to involve in this uh, annotation. So when, when, when people ask us to do, okay, well, Jerome, you, you can do juvenile homo. I say, come on, juvenile homo has been only been known in insects, maybe also in crustaceans. We, we never will be able to think that you'll be in centipede. So say, okay, it's a global effort. We try it. To our big surprise, which also become a, a major point of that genome paper, we found that, yeah, actually, this kind of system seems to be also found outside insects and crustaceans and centipede in the same for the first time. So um, recently, I mean, uh, with a project funded by the ECF, I mean, uh, of our uh, Hong Kong SAL government, so uh, we have been uh, asking uh, together, I mean, if you can see, sorry, the, the logo is a little bit small, uh, uh, funded by the uh, government, we do get together with our WWF Hong Kong, together with the GRM, and also our School of Life Sciences, and also around 20 secondary schools in Hong Kong. Which we do not understand how many meter per species we have in Hong Kong. In that project, uh, that has been finished project, we asked the students, I mean, together with our staff, go to the field and try to take out and see what are the millipedes that we have. We have found not only millipedes, but the soil macrofauna, all the soil animals you are able to find. Just millipedes alone, we, we found about 26 species from Hong Kong. I mean, we, we make a postcard showing you over here. These are the ones that we'll be able to find in Hong Kong. Of course, some of them are also shared together with, uh, in other places, uh, in mainland China or Asia. But we seem to find that one, of course, for now, it seems to be unique in Hong Kong so far. We also find many, many other, many soil macrofauna. I mean, uh, about roughly about 200 species, 180, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers. And after we do that together with the citizen science to do that, we go back, of course, our academics. We, we want to understand more. So this has been done by Kevin Nong uh, Henry, so in, in the lab. So we, we, we sequence the first two millipede genomes to understand what is actually happening. Can we actually use them as a model? Because when people think about soil animals in agriculture, many people think about earthworm. Earthworm are of course important, but many people have neglected millipede, which are actually, if you go to a forest, for example, they are very efficient nutrient cyclists, all the leaf and litter, they are the nutrient recyclers. I mean, in, in the system that has been overlooked. So I'm not going to talk about all the findings that we have in the military. For example, we are able to find, well, I, I call a joke like a chemical defense, this venom. And this thing will produce a lot of like hydrogen cyanide gas. And we're able to identify what are the genes actually involved, for example. Having a genome allow us to recover and discover what actually the underlying biology and also allow us to develop new models. Why am I saying that? Not only my lab have been trying to do from insects to trying to look for a new generation of insecticide through the regulation of juvenile hormone and microRNAs, et cetera, and the development. And also we try to look for new models. I mean, plant and insect interactions and also new models like millipedes. Now, in the, in the era of genomics, we, we for example, in, in UK, the Darwin Tree of Life is now proposing to sequence every single species in UK. The United States are thinking of sequencing every single species in the United States. That's been called a moonshot project in biology. So it's like 
we try to do a very difficult task. I mean, in this region, in Asia, uh, Earth Power Genome Project, many people have been proposing. I mean, I need to tell you, this is not just science, scientifically important. Science-wise, this allows us to have a better understanding of evolution, interaction of organisms, and also the biology. But socially, this also allows new applications development and also using resources in a sustainable way. So for example, we'll be able to look, oh, could this be a certain type of population in certain area we need to preserve, et cetera. So the Earth Bio Genome Project, we are trying to launch a project of Earth Bio Genome Project in Hong Kong. And we are very, very grateful to the Hong Kong Research Grant Council Collaborative Research Fund. Uh, we are going to get the first um, system of our SQL2E system. Don't worry about the name. This is the system that will allow you to do genome sequencing in a very, very efficient and massive way. So we want to sequence the genomes in this region. And we are going to launch, uh, me, okay. We're going to launch a, a campaign later and also ask the citizens to give us suggestions. What would, you, what would you like to know? Genomes maybe will be useful for you to know, okay? This is something we are going to start quite soon. So stay in touch. So uh, today, with the limited amount of time, again, I thank for the organization. Thank Professor Lam, thank for the AOE, thank for my university, Chinese University in Hong Kong. I talked about global food security, environment, environment and sustainability. And I hope, agree, I hope you agree or get convinced that insects and other arthropods actually play a very important role in addition to the plants itself. And their interactions are very important. I've shown you about a few survey that we have done in Hong Kong to better understand the insects and also other microfauna, um, no matter in the soil, the insects, the pests, and the beneficial insects. I've been showing you the studies in my lab going through the biotechnology from using microRNAs, genomics, etc., to better understand their interaction, to develop new, new generation of insecticides, how we can do together with the plants, and also we are trying to see if we can understand more from this region by sequencing more genomes. For that, of course, I need to thank, I mean, this, I, I cannot do this by myself. I need to have very good collaborators. I mean, including the one sitting next to me, Professor Lam, and also many good friends. I mean, T.F. Chan, uh, um, many people in the AOE, et cetera. Uh, you know, I also need to thank our Grand Council, uh, Hong Kong Research Grand Council, Sustainable uh, Agricultural Development Fund, ECF, AFCD, our Stakey Lab, uh, at the Chinese U, and also, of course, my university and our School of Life Sciences. Now, mainly, of course, I personally, I really need to thank the group members that I have in my lab to do this fantastic work. I mean, if that's good, it's because of that. If something is bad, because it's me, okay? So uh, uh, that's all what I want to say today. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about uh, what we have been doing, we have set up a new website, I mean, this link, there are many different projects that there are more introduction on that website. You can look into more details. Of course, if there are questions that you may not be able to ask today and you want to ask me, feel free to contact me at this email. And uh, this is, of course, our beautiful campus. And again, I thank you for the time and uh, for listening. So, yeah, yeah if, you, if you have questions, you're welcome to ask. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerome. Uh, before we take any questions, so I suggest us to take a group photo. <laughs> so could everybody turn on your camera and uh, if possible, remove your mask so that uh, we can take a photo together. So let's sit here. Yeah. Okay, so so I please help to take the photo. Okay, well, uh, we look at the camera and we look at a few. First, one, two, three. Okay, we'll take one more. One, two, three. Okay, one, one two, three. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so, um, well, I guess uh, the biodiversity of insects play an important role in sustainable environment. Uh, of course, uh, 
we have worked in agriculture, we always think about pests that will destroy our crops. But insects could do a lot of good things to us, including recycling of the nutrients or pollination, for example, right? So it's very important to maintain a healthy population of insects and understand how it interacts with plants and crops. And Jerome used the state-of-the-art genomic technology to investigate such system, as well as uh, doing some mechanistic studies, including the development and the juvenile hormone, etc. So I think it will give us a um, tool for agricultural biologists to think of how we can plan a sustainable agriculture. So um, now the uh, floor is open for questions and discussions. So whoever would like to uh, ask a question, please unmute yourself, or you can type it in in the chat box. So it's now open for Q&A, please. So, so this is Kit Chan, right? So in, uh, actually it's in 1984, I was being sent by my mentor to go to Texas A&M. So what we, what we see is that they, they, I follow a Professor M.D. Sumner. He said actually at A&M, they have a department of entomology. So at CUHK, I learned all these insects from uh, Chong Sai Jam. So <laughs> Professor Jam, but anyway, my, my, I guess my question is that at that time, baccalovirus is a polyhedron gene. What do you really see in the global landscape? How all this wonderful insect uh, study would have a major impact in the agriculture? And now of all these different insects, which one would you pick have the highest potential? So that's for the global perspective. From the locality, it's very admirable when I see your slides about all these like worm and you motivate the high school kids. So I was growing up in new territory and I'm fortunate enough and go to my backyard, I dig up the soil, I see the earthworm, I see all these all different stuff. It's, to me, it's fascinating. One word is fascinating habitat. And in the local environment, what would you really propose and how do you promote it and how do we really popularize and, and make sure that our kids, our next generation would learn how to appreciate the importance of uh, insect study. And when I was in CHK, I was, uh, I was focusing on the microbiology. I would, for, the, for the people who work on Chong Chai, I would say that it's a low cost science. But as I gradually growing up, I just really know that how wonderful, wonderful this living organism and its impact to, human, uh, to mankind. So, uh Thank you. I mean, I, of course, I couldn't agree more that they're, they're very important and that they are fascinating and they are going to bring a new enlightenment for our new generation. So I, I answer your second question first, which is uh, how we are going to, um, to provide, um, how, how we can arouse the interest of the, of the students, I mean, itself. So I think, I mean, throughout the, the, um, the survey that we have, I mean, I think get them engaged. It's actually very important because, well, I, I actually, we, we, we need to write a report, right? Because we have been funded by the ECF. So actually, well, some students told us that uh, when, when they go to the field, at, at, at the beginning, well, we were very, very excited, but they go to the field and said, uh, maybe uh, I don't want to touch it. Uh, eventually they think, oh, okay, I can do it. And they can actually identify which species and which species. And that kind of a learning and, and experience is the best way for them to to actually get into. So, uh, of course, if people say, well, documentary is okay, I think, of course, and multiple channels are fine, but hands-on experience, I believe, is always the key to, to, to answer your second question. And, uh, of course, I mean, at Chinese University of Hong Kong, how we can do that? Can we actually open some spaces, or can we also actually do? Um, as you, if you remember the talk that I've been showing, I mean, which we are going to do is, uh, we're going to use an app. Because we, we have been seeing that people actually, new generation of uh, not only students, youngsters or teenagers, they want to learn a little bit of farming, leisure farming. So, and, and the way that if you ask them to grow, they, they'll say, oh, so sometimes I see something, what should that be? So we're using, trying to use a 3D model to also get that sense in. Once they feel engaged, I think that's the best way, then they will begin to, 
to try to find and learn more about biodiversity, insects, etc., in frogs. Your first question is super difficult to answer, I mean, I'm afraid. Well, the reason is because, for example, uh, under climate change, well, this kind of insects may be growing in this area, but they may also do my, well, as you know, you, you study entomology, you know they do migration. So the other places, they may be bad, they may be good. So uh, I don't want to pick a particular one. I think that should be regional specific. Uh, when you need also to look into the consideration of the crops or the, or the associated or the surrounding um, plants that are having is, uh, is I, I would say that should be uh, like a holistic view. Uh, rather than picking, uh, I think I will, I will be very, very biased and say this one is important because I'm working on it. Uh, no, uh, I think every different question, every different scenario, and every different geographical location, they will have different, they will have a different question. So I hope that is fair in that case. Well, this is a follow-up and also a comment. So for our new president, so to him, Biden, President Biden really look at the green uh, technology and green environment. I think, I don't think that he's really more focused in this like microflora, right, or what we can do in our soil and everything. I think this is a very important body of science. And I, and I think that, that you know, the, the new president, particularly in the United States, when he keep talking about green technology, and so uh, I, I probably would use your email and ask you more questions. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I'm very happy to, to assist in whatever scenario. Right, thank you. I think Marcia has uh, raised your hand, right? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Lam. I, I, I have uh, uh, a question for Jerome. So um, I know you, you saw the, the latest publication about uh, the discovery that a white fly uses a stolen plant gene uh, to, elucid, to elude its host defense. Um, uh, it was published in uh, recently, a short uh, paper was published in Nature, but I think the main paper was published in, in Cell. Uh, did you ever see this in your, in your screens or are you only looking at, uh, at the, from, from an animal perspective and you didn't uh, look at both? Uh, thank you, Maso. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm aware of that study. I mean, the, the study for, for those in the audience may not know well. I mean, there's a very interesting case. What it's showing is actually the white fly in the plant, okay? So this is the first case showing that there's actually a horizontal gene transfer coming in between the two, okay? Uh, well, it's published in, in Cell and Nature. I mean, I, I think that is reasonable. So that means actually something that is actually coming from one organism. You think they have interaction all the time, but the gene can actually be transferred into the other species genome. I think this is something that haven't been looked very carefully before. Um, actually, we look into, but I, won't, I don't want to say that now. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is going to be a very, very becoming a very hot area. So, and how are we going to utilize those information when you're actually coming from the other genome? So what are they actually happening? Uh, yeah, they are, they are going to be very important for uh, no matter controlling the numbers for insects or actually benefit the, uh, the crops itself. Yeah, so thank you, Marcelo. Yeah. So that's the thank question in the chat box by Chi Yin Li. So yeah. he would like to know how to introduce RNA bantam into fruit flies to inhibit juvenile hormone. Okay, so, uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, uh, that's uh, so basically, what we try to do is uh, make a construct. Uh, uh, I hope you're having a background in molecular biology. If not, you're trying to get some DNA, okay? You put in, uh, in very simple terms, you put in the DNA together with the bantam, for example, with your microRNA. You inject them into the embryos, okay? Our fertilized embryos, you inject them. So, uh, of course, we can, we can put in some selection marker so we know that, oh, they're actually mutants. So after, after that, we cross the flies that you will be able to make mutants like that. But I, I understand the question that you're asking is actually more than that. Is if you want to do that in the field, how are you going to do it, right? So uh, this is also an area that we, we have been trying to develop is how can we actually massively uh, produce a lot of microRNAs in the field? Of course, this has been the idea that we have been talking with Professor Lam for many years ago. You think, no, RNA won't work, okay? Take a look at what, what is happening with our vaccine now, right? Okay, so 
it, it, it works, I mean, it, it, it works, but how we can, but before we try to do that in insects, I'm talking about in this case, we need to make sure that they will be non, they are only specific to that particular insect, so to that particular group, otherwise they will be very, very disastrous event. Yeah. So I hope I can answer your question. Okay, so maybe I ask a question. <laughs> okay. So, well, I, I guess I just have some imagination. So food security is also, it's always a problem. So could some insects be developed to become food of human? Ha! Um, take a sweet coffee chair. <laughs> so uh, no, I, I was joking. I mean, I, I, I was asking uh, whether whether that I, I watched a, a Korean movie, which is very interesting because uh, they are using cockroaches and then try to make food. I mean, uh, actually, I've been approached by a biotech company. They've been thinking about those. Of course, not feeding human. Okay, <laughs> feeding feeding uh, uh, other other uh, animals, etc. Um, I think, um, well, actually using insects in order to go for even the, the, the products, the food waste have also been, uh, have also been doing, okay? I, I, it has not been doing very properly in Hong Kong. Many people only focus on like beetles, I mean, but uh, I think there are many things that can be done. Um, uh, so I, again, I don't want to, um, <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I, I always want to get more open-minded, so I don't want to propose a specific one. I also, also depends on scenario. For example, uh, we it's not my PhD student. I, 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 one of my colleagues has retired, and now I'm the co-supervisor, and she's actually working on food waste using insects to, to do, uh, uh, using different kinds of insects, you know, different waste and different food products and et cetera. So uh, yes, they can be done, et cetera. But, uh, I think human always has a concern of eating insects. So it should be insects, and let's just go one for checking out. I mean, maybe filling a fish or whatever. That we eat the fish, that we be better. I think that would be more acceptable. Okay. Yeah, yeah. because I always think that uh, insects are high in protein, and it is a recycler of yeah. nutrients. So it should be very energy efficient if you can make use of it in the food chain. So, but anyway, so that's another question by Coleman. Yeah. Yeah, so... So Coleman is asking whether we can uh, create artificial juvenile homes to increase the population of beneficial insects for agricultural purposes. I think this has been, hasn't been tried, and I think that should be, for example, bees, or even those insects that are actually taking away the pests, so they, are, they also regard them as beneficial insects, right? Uh, yes, that is possible. And, um, and uh, as I've said, uh, artificial Juvenile home is very difficult to, to make, okay? The reason is because uh, it's very difficult to synthesize that step. So what you can make um, uh, mimics uh, to those, uh, I think that is possible, uh, just haven't been tried. And you need a, a partner that is willing to try because uh, when I first uh, collaborated with Professor Lam, I said, oh, well, you should try to do something on soybean together. And then he said, okay, you can do it, there, not here, because you will eat all my soybean. So you need to find a partner with a space that you can do the cross on, or etc. So I, I was joking. Yeah, uh, it can be done. Well, I want to follow up on this, right? If you synthesize a complex um, molecule from by the local process, of course, mm. it take a long time. Yeah. But how about uh, if you have identified similar compounds from plants, for example? Then you may, a few oh. steps is enough to convert it into bioactive compound that can be used. Is it a possibility? Uh, that's a super clever idea. I don't think that has been thought before. Uh, this is a very good idea. Yeah, you can be, try? Yeah, because I, I believe that, uh, for example, turbines is quite similar to the structure of juvenile hormone, maybe some side chain changes. So if we can just target to a few steps, that could be much easier than the you synthesize from carbon and nitrogen. Yeah, that is clever. That's very clever. Thank you. Okay, so is there any other questions from the floor? Uh, uh, Dr. Wei, I just have a comment about this, uh, the, the, the structure of this uh, juvenile hormone. Actually, right. it looks like some of the flavor compounds. 
you know, flavor industry or pharmaceutical industry, they do make a lot of those similar compounds. So you can consider that route for, you know. Uh, so uh, that, when I first met Professor Lam, he said, uh, I met him and his wife, and then he said, oh, that is called juvenile hormone. And he's thinking about exactly the same thing. Uh, as a scientist, I have to say that hasn't been passed. Uh, they call juvenile hormone. It has never been tested in human, etc. Uh, uh, we can try to explore, but uh, there's no evidence so far, but uh, uh, here we can try. SK2, right? SK3, let's go. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think Dr. Joanna Chan is talking about the, the flavor. Oh, the flavor, no. The flavor. The, flavor the, the taste, yeah. the taste. Oh, I see. Sorry. Okay. Because the uh, um, flavor industry uh, identify many different flavor compounds in different from the plant origin, from the animals, and they carry all kinds of structure. Oh, I see. So when I look at the structure you draw, you know, they look like some of the flavor compounds, which uh, some of the advanced flavor company, they do this uh, synthesis. So they do have advanced research and invest a lot in this area. Maybe there's a chance to talk to this uh, research team. Maybe there's a possibility they can synthesize similar compound or extract from different uh, origin sources. Yeah, that, that is an uh, extremely good idea. I mean, the, the, uh, thank you for, for, for the suggestion. The reason is because when, if you remember the talk I've shown on the military, right? So I, I'm talking about hydrogen cyanide. Why am I so excited? Is because because cameras have been using packets. They only know the, the, the products, and they never know what is actually the whole pathway. And when we have the genome, now we know. So uh, I think, yeah, we, we should actually look into possibilities combining genomics and also looking at the flavors. That is a very good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll be happy to facilitate because I, I used to work for flavor company who devote a lot on the, you know, the chemical research. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So that's okay. one question. My, my other question is, as a, as a layman, I see many insects in my backyard. <laughs> When I dig into the, the soil, so how do I know it's too, too many insects or not enough insects? And uh, for the apps that you were making for the pets, where you indicate the, you know, the, the bad type that we should eliminate? So there are two questions. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I, I answer the second question first, which is easier. So uh, 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 for the app, uh, so we are actually showing you the whole survey that we have been doing in biodiversity in Hong Kong for, for the farmers. So, you will see not only the pests, you also see beneficial insects, but also the one that we identify as neutral. Okay, so uh, it's only not a web. I mean, I'm sorry, it's not only an app, it's also on the website. I mean, uh, we will launch it later this year. So uh, you, you have everything. Yes, you will have an idea of which is good, which is bad. Uh, regarding numbers, I mean, I think that really depends not only on the numbers, but actually what you have been planting on your backyard, right? So uh, it needs to have a combination of both. So uh, uh, that is the second question. So, so for the first part, uh, uh, that is, well, what was the first question? Is it, is it relating to the backyard or? Um, no, first question is backyard, the second question is the app, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, good, okay, I, I got it. Yeah, so but, uh, yeah, I, I personally also look very much forward to, to the app because of, yeah, the, yeah, we, we are excited. We are very excited. I mean, it's the first time that we try to use a 3D model for insight. And uh, because of what, I mean, we, we'll see how the citizens are feeling. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, is there any further questions for Jerome? Well, I, I guess I need to explain the name of Jerome, right? So Jerome Hoi, you, you saw this JH, also similar to juvenile hormone. So <laughs> I always believe that's the reason why he is addicted to the study of juvenile hormone because of his name. But anyway, uh, is there any other questions uh, from the floor? Okay, so if not, let me... Um, First of, all, first of all, let me thank you everyone for your active participation and uh, discussion. So I would like to do some advertisement for our next talk. So our next talk will be on the topic of innovative solutions for plant building, a biotechnology research company's perspective by Mathieu Van Eck from Netherlands. 
So when X is the, the principal scientist in the agricultural industry plant, and he invented many technology you know, for agricultural application. So we, we are very honored to have him to discuss agriculture in, in the viewpoint of a company, so a research company. So I hope that uh, his pers perspective will help those who would like to develop in uh, agricultural industry, especially our friends in South Africa. Okay, so if you're interested, you can just using your cell phone to register by scanning the QR code. And my assistant will also send you the invitation later if you have leave your email to us. Okay, so uh, with that, I think uh, we have an enjoyable evening in Hong Kong and probably uh, some other time in different parts of the world. And I hope that this kind of efforts to um, to help people to understand more on different aspects of agriculture can, can be continued through your effort. There's a lot of potential uh, speaker in this group, and some of them has already agreed to talk, such, such as the Albert, who uh, from a lawyer's uh, viewpoint, right? So we will see uh, each other again next month. So bye for now, and uh, stay healthy. Okay, thank you. Bye -bye.